so many people, including myself, take at least one uh, medication. I'm wondering if I should have taken two this morning. Uh, but the one I'm supposed to take uh, lowers cholesterol. Uh, and it turns out that most drugs are simply chemicals that bind to and inhibit a specific protein in our body. And we refer to that as the drug's uh, target or protein target. So again, my cholesterol-lowering drug binds to a protein that our bodies use to make cholesterol. But if, for example, some of you may be taking blood thinners, those drugs block or inhibit proteins that are needed for your blood to clot, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it turns out until the latter part of the last century, the way most drugs were discovered was as follows. You look for a chemical that did something useful, which in our case might be a chemical that could kill a cancer cell, and then you use the chemical to go now find the, the target of, of, of the chemical. Now, this turned out to be problematic for at least two reasons. The first is it turns out it's actually too easy to find chemicals that will kill cancer cells. Uh, Clorox bleach, for example, would work perfectly well. But the challenge is not to find Clorox bleach. The, the challenge is to find some chemical that will harm or kill cancer cells, but not kill an, or, or harm normal cells. So that's really the challenge. The, the second fundamental problem is uh, if you're trying to develop a drug, until you really know its protein target, you simply can't optimize it. So, for example, if, you want, if, you, if you're developing a new drug and you, and you discover it can inhibit protein A, uh, you, you need to know that to make sure that the drug now won't inhibit protein B and protein C. So you can't really chemically optimize the drug until you actually know what protein in the cell it's interacting with. So then what happened was there was sort of a, a paradigm shift. So now in modern drug discovery, drug hunters would prefer to start with a protein that you know is or hope is linked to some disease. And so, for example, for our discussion today, this might be a protein that's near and dear uh, to cancer cells. And then they'll use their chemistry to try to find chemicals that will interact with that protein. And, and this paradigm shift was greatly accelerated in the year 2000 when the first draft of the human genome sequence was released because now for the first time we actually had the list of all the potential protein targets in a cell. So that was the, the good news. Uh, the bad news was there are about 20,000 of them. And so you can see that it, absent any other information, your, your chance of picking the right target for a given disease is about 20,000 to one. So you, so you need more information. Uh, and, and this is important for our discussion today because our, our colleagues in pharma and biotech rely very heavily on academic scientists uh, at institutions like the Dana-Farber to tell them what targets should we be pursuing as we try to develop the next generation of cancer drugs. And then as you've heard, and you'll hear more this morning, on occasion, uh, for a variety of reasons, we pursue those targets our ourselves internally at the Dana-Farber and we'll identify chemical matter that will interact uh, with those targets. So, so really the discussion today is, well, how do you go about choosing uh, those targets, uh, especially given the fact that there are, are, are 20,000 of them. So uh, since there are 20,000, I'm only going to represent three uh, for today. So we have the, uh, the tennis racket protein, uh, we have the, the bear protein, uh, and we have the pickup truck uh, protein. Now, it turns out amongst the scientists of the Dana-Farber are scientists who are very good at studying the functions and the three-dimensional structures of various proteins. And for some of these proteins, we've learned a lot over the past 10 or 20 years. For other proteins, frankly, we're still just uh, scraping the surface. But if, for example, one of our scientists had already figured out that the, the payload in this truck was something cancer cells really, really like, you might say, well, maybe we should get a drug that will inhibit uh, the truck. Or, or maybe one of our scientists knows that uh, a protein that resembles one of these three proteins has been used by cancers before. So maybe, for example, if squash rackets can cause cancer, maybe you'd start to worry about tennis rackets. Maybe we should think a little bit more deeply about the tennis racket. So we can look at the, at the various proteins in the cell, but of course the nice thing is there are other places uh, that we can look, because you, I think you all know that for every protein in your DNA, there's a region of that DNA that now contains the instructions or the blueprint for making that protein. So we refer to that as the gene for that protein. And for most genes, you have two copies, the one you got from mom and the one you got from dad. So, uh, for example, for, that, for this truck, 
Uh, we have scientists who are very good at looking at DNA and looking at the genes and reading the blueprints. So we can look at the, the, the blueprint uh, that you got from dad, and we can look at the blueprint you got from mom. Uh, but now with modern technology, we can very rapidly look at the blueprint in cancer cells. And in fact, we can look at all 20,000 protein blueprints in various cancers, whether they're pediatric cancers, whether they're adult cancers. And, and frankly, one of the really transformative events over the past decade is the cost of doing this has actually fallen even faster than the cost of integrated circuits that made the iPhone possible. So now this is quite realistic that rapidly, within days and at a reasonable cost, I'm sorry about that, I said reasonable cost, you can identify and look for now alterations in the blueprints in a cancer relative to a normal cell. So suppose, for example, uh, you looked at 100 lung cancers and you found that quite frequently there was an error or what we call a mutation in, in the blueprint for the truck. And in fact, more often than not, the wheels were missing from the truck. Well, that would tell the scientists that if anything, that cancer was trying to inactivate the truck. This was, this was a good guy, that a, what a scientist would call a tumor suppressor gene, and apparently the cancer is trying to inactivate the truck. But now imagine instead that instead of the wheels being missing, uh, the scientist has discovered that the six-cylinder engine has been now replaced with an eight-cylinder engine. So that would kind of pique your interest a little bit. And now you would be concerned that this is no longer, this is not a good guy. This, this is a bad guy. This is something now that the cancer is using for its own purposes. And that would be close to a smoking gun uh, that maybe this, this is a potential target uh, in, in lung cancer. And I should also say parenthetically, with this revolution in DNA sequencing, both in terms of speed and cost, the Dana-Farber was also one of the first institutes around the world to also begin to integrate this kind of information uh, into clinical, clinical management. OK, so we can look at the, the protein. We can look at the blueprint. Uh, but there, uh, there's one other place we can look, and that is when a cell wants to make more protein. So for example, wants to make more of the truck protein. Uh, you know, it wants to keep these, these blueprints safe. It's not going to you know, imperil these blueprints. So when a cell wants more of a particular protein, what it does is it makes carbon copies of the blueprint, uh, which scientists call RNA, or technically mRNA. Uh, and it sends these copies of the blueprint to a factory where protein gets made. And the important thing is the more copies of the blueprint that were made, the more of the protein you're going to make. And so now with modern technology, we can actually go into a cancer cell versus a normal cell, and we can measure the abundance of these copies for every one of the 20,000 mRNAs. And we can look for examples where, for example, there was more truck mRNA in the cancer cell than in the normal cell. And that might be another hint that, you know, cancer is like the, the, the truck. Okay, so now we've talked about protein, we've talked about DNA, and we've talked about RNA. But, you know, the problem is most of the things, in fact, all the things I just told you about are sort of guilt by association. You know, I can start to put together pieces of evidence that maybe we want to worry about uh, the truck. Uh, but this is all guilt by association. But now we have new tools to really ask whether the truck really was causing or maintaining the cancer. So one is a new technology called RNA interference, which you can think of as sort of like a molecular shredder. <clears throat> so we can actually, in the laboratory, just get rid of all these <clears throat> mRNAs, and now the truck <clears throat> will disappear, and we can ask whether that affects cancer cells in a way that's different than the way it affects normal cells. But what's particularly exciting is now we have a new technology called CRISPR, for short, CRISPR-based gene editing, which you can think of as like a set of drafting tools. And so we can now rewrite the, the, the blueprint here. And so, for example, uh, we could get rid of the truck blueprint, but if we wanted to, we could change the engine, we could remove the accelerator, the brake, etc. And this is important because to understand a target, you really need to understand its functions. Uh, so it's, it's one thing to know that the cancer is like the truck, but it's another to know why it likes the truck and what it is about the truck that the cancer is, is using. And so that's a very important aspect of drug discovery. And so in that regard, our laboratory studies a, a gene or a protein, which is technically called VHL, but for today's talk, it's the bear protein. And it turns out there are some families, including some families in New England, that are, that are passing down generation to generation to generation a, a mutation in, in the bear blueprint. So they have an altered bear, and they're at high risk for certain cancers, including kidney cancer. And our group noticed that the cancers these patients were developing we're constantly producing the distress signals 
that you or I would start to produce if we suddenly went to the top of the Mount Everest. So these are the distress signals that our bodies produce when we're not getting enough oxygen, but the tumors lacking the bear protein were constantly making these distress signals. And so based on that clue, we were able to uh, determine that the, the bear protein actually is part of a molecular circuit that's used by all animals on the planet, including us, to sense and adapt to changes in oxygen. And uh, that was the work that led to the Lasker Prize, but uh, more importantly, it's also led to new treatments for cancer, as well as new treatments that are in development for anemia and heart attack and stroke. And that brings me to one of my last points, which is the fruits of science are very difficult uh, to predict. And so, for example, the scientists who made that molecular shredder possible, the RNA interference, were actually just studying how RNA gets regulated in flies and in worms. The scientists who made CRISPR gene editing possible were, were really just curious about how bacteria defended themselves from viruses. Uh, by the way, this work led to a Nobel Prize, and this work on CRISPR will almost certainly lead to a Nobel Prize. Even the breakthroughs in immunology that you've heard about in immuno-oncology were really made possible by basic scientists, including scientists like Gordon Freeman and Lee Nadler at the Dana-Farber, who were simply trying to understand the rules in terms of how the immune system works. But once you understood the rules, you could start to bring forth new therapies for immuno-oncology, but now there are also new treatments being developed for autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis uh, and uh, for lupus. And so the, the point there being you can't always predict the fruits of science. You know, I sometimes point out to people that the next breakthrough for pancreatic cancer might come from someone working on pancreatic cancer, but it might well come from somebody who's studying lung cancer, or for that matter, someone who's still trying to figure out what this tennis racket was all about. And so I guess in closing, I'll point out one last thing. At the, at the Thanksgiving table, uh, a discussion we used to have was, well, you know, what's wrong with you cancer biologists? I mean, when Kennedy said we were going to put a man on the moon, we, we, he said it would take 10 years, and we did it in 10 years. You know, Nixon announced the war on cancer in 1972, and you guys are still, you know, in trench warfare. What's wrong with you? And it took me years to figure out what the answer was, but the answer is, that all the science that you needed to know to put a man on the moon was known by 1960. So putting a man on the moon was an engineering problem. It was not a scientific problem, thanks to people like Galileo and Newton, who had come and gone. And because it was an engineering problem, you could start to lay out timelines and deliverables and cost and say, we can do this in a decade. Unfortunately, cancer is a mixture of an engineering problem, but it's still largely a scientific problem. So we have to continue to invest in science. And I'm, very uh, proud and, uh, and grateful of the fact that the Dana-Farber, with the help of its benefactors, continues to invest in basic science as well as in the application of the knowledge that's generated by that science. Thank you very much.